My name is Deandra Lawson. I'm Assistant Curator of Photography at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Today, I'll be speaking with Lyle Ashton Harris as part of the series, Five Questions, Five Artists, Reframing Portraiture, presented in conjunction with the LACMA exhibition, Black American Portraits, on view at LACMA through April 17th. We're asking five artists the same set of five questions, culminating in a range of perspectives about how we can interpret portraiture and understand its significance today. Lyle Ashton Harris is one of the most influential artists working anywhere. He was born in New York and raised between the Bronx and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. For over three decades, his work has examined history, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, representation, and the intersections between the personal and the political. Harris's practice is multidisciplinary, ranging from video to installation to collage, but firmly rooted in a critical exploration of photography. Harris often uses his own body in works that call our attention to the performative aspects of image making and the self. Harris rose to prominence in the 1980s. He earned his MFA from the California Institute for the Arts right here in Los Angeles in 1990. He then attended the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Study Program in 92. Among his breakout bodies of work was his series Constructs, which he made during his first year at CalArts. That work was exhibited right away in the seminal exhibition Black Male, Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art, organized by Thelma Golden at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which came here to LA at the Hammer Museum in 94. Harris's work is represented in museum collections at LACMA, the MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, of Art, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, the Tate Modern in London, among many others. Needless to say, Harris exhibits around the world. The Institute for Contemporary Art in Miami presented his most recent solo, Lyle Ashton Harris Ectochrome Archive this fall. Next year, the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University will present a solo exhibition of three decades of work. Harris's work, The Child, which he made collaboratively with Renee Cox in 1994, is on view in Black American Portraits at LACMA from the museum's Audrey and Sidney Ermis collection of self-portraiture. Harris is a professor of art at NYU and lives and works in New York. Um, and without further ado, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Lyle to join me in conversation um, today. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing um, well. Thanks for a wonderful introduction. Of course. It's um, so pleased to be in conversation with you today. Yeah. And, and we've never met in person. So, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm looking forward, I, I did not, I, I had FOMO for missing out the opening, but I'm very much looking forward to coming out in February um, and um, walking through the show together then, so. We, we really look forward to it. Um, I guess to start to kick off, and you're someone who has been for a long time um, investigating um, representation and portraiture. Um, the first question in our series sort of asks us, to grapple with the definitions of portraiture. So I guess we can start off by saying, how do you define portraiture? What does it mean to you? Um, I, I'll start by saying I'm not the best student, so, but I'll <laughs> I'm gonna try my best. Um, I would say over the last um, few decades that two distinct consistent trajectories preoccupied my studio practice. Um, one is informed by a documentary impulse that's exemplified by the Ectochrome archive that recently showed, as you mentioned, at the ICA in uh, Miami, like, like just closed. And the other is a much more conceptually driven studio practice with an emphasis on performative um, self-portraits, self I would say. Should we bring up your first slide so we have some- Yeah, let's do that, yeah, okay. <laughs> we have some, some work. Yeah. So this is, um, 
this is sort of your seminal work from the, the, the late 80s and sort of, I think, exemplifying what you were describing as your conceptual practice, sort of working around and within the realm of perform performance art, self-portraiture. Maybe you could expand upon that. Well, I should also somehow say that my grandfather um, was assistant analyst for the Port Authority, but he also was a serious amateur photographer that shot over 10,000 ectochrome slides, I should say, starting in the mid 40s um, up until let's say video came on the consumer market and then he began to create an archive of video. So both my brother filmmaker Thomas Allen Harris and I had been highly influ influenced you know, by our grandfather, deep investment in the archive. If we think about um, Bell Hooks in terms of her seminal thesis that before, um, like during segregation, that it was within the family home that on the walls or in kitchens that black, the, gal the black gallery was. So that was an important thing to somehow mention that from an early um, day, um, from the early days prior to going to Wesleyan or Kellogg's, that there was a, a sophisticated understanding of, let's say, portraiture, the image. Um, and my grandfather was a race man who was um, from Albany and he very much understood the importance for the image as a way to document and to offer um, um, a counter narrative to the prevailing representations of African Americans, you know, both um, nationally but also Black people in the global context. He's very much aware of that. So, um, so, but these works, um, the Americas, um, were is actually my undergraduate thesis. Um, I was taking a course my junior year. I was an econ major for two years. And then I dropped out of school, went to visit my brother, who was on a fellowship from Harvard in Amsterdam, came back with our chair, went over and Isaac Prep, came back to school, and I wound up dropping out for a semester. And I really went and to go back to finish up, change my major. It was my, my South African stepfather who encouraged my family to let me do what I want to do. Because as you know, at that point, if you were African-American, that there were um, from the background that I came from, there were a couple of choices that were offered to you that would be professional or <laughs> acceptable careers, careers, if you will. Um, so um, I was very much influenced by the work of um, Hazel Carby, uh, you know, a um, visionary and um, important um, scholar on women's studies and African American literature. In fact, um, Saidiya Hartman was a student of hers as, as well. And uh, I was taking a class with her in 19th century black women's fiction and the role of the mulatto character. If you imagine like in popular culture exemplified by Birth of a Nation that the way in which the, the mulatto character was often maligned and stereotyped as someone who was ineffectual the fact that in, um, um, in American culture, it was a figure who was subversive. And it's interesting seeing the film Passing um, on Netflix, the fact that these works would somehow, in a way, anticipate this discussion that's sort of going on right now. So, and yeah. No, no I mean, um, I see. So, I mean, uh, in terms of sort of the, the narrative of sort of the tragic mulatto, I mean, bringing back now to the composition of this work, we see sort of a woman centered at the figure and you and dressed in white face, um, sort of bringing in those influences into, into, into the, the composition. And also the idea of like both gender and race as a construct in which it is. So I think it was definitely playing with those tropes. If you think about um, 19th century Broadwood culture, you would often have element of um, drag performance within, you know, at the heart of, let's say, the American theater, et cetera, and often those things are forgotten. And it is curious now, particularly this, this triptych, how it relates to the work that's um, on exhibit in Black, um, in the Black American portraits, if you think about the prescient discussion or engagement with issues of, let's say, gender, in a way, giving skin to different notions of the family, if you will, um, that now has become, you know, um, in a very important way, part of the, you know, the American, but the global landscape in terms of like alternative families, you know, alternative sense of identities, for gender, et cetera. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting thinking about how art in a way can anticipate that. Um, that said, it's also curious if you think about the recent 
atavistic somehow backlash in relationship to certain, let's say, trans identity as evidenced by, you know, famous, uh, let's say, um, um, famous um, comedians. So it is curious that at once, I mean, this sort of maybe get into the fourth question, that once you have this almost this abundance of, let's say, plural, pluralities in terms of issues of gender, and sexuality, and race, but there is a backlash happening as well so it is curious at this particular time that you'll be having that so i think if this is such an inspiring starting point i mean knowing that this is sort of you're coming out of an undergraduate you know a very young artist sort of thinking sort of this acknowledgement right from the get-go that performance and photography are inexorably linked Mm. Um, and that mm. the self is always is always constructed. And also this idea, conversely, with documentarian practice, as you're getting out with the family archive, right, that the, the family snapshot is kind of a way of possessing the other, right? Like it's a picture of you. It's a picture of me. And so like there's this, there's like these dualities between mm. how we're thinking about the self through the, the realm of documentation, possessing the, the other, the you, as mm-hmm. well as in this work, um, which really, I think, you know, reveals to us how the self um, performs and plays in front of the cam- camera and is constructed in for, for the camera. Of course, yes, yes. Um, I wonder if we could go to the next side to and see in this um you know these really seminal works um saint michael stewart in which you portray yourself after the african-american man who was killed by police and i wondered if you could speak michael stewart yes michael stewart um who was also an art student at pratt Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) and was um you know graffitied in the subway and was arrested and then killed um, here you present yourself as Stuart wearing a police uniform. And I wonder if you could speak to sort of the transformative aspects of representation or portraiture, the possibilities of transformation. Um, very good question. Well, what struck me, um, the, I should just um, back up and saying this body work we're looking at right now is um, called The Good Life. And it was my first um, solo show in New York City in 1994. And in fact, it was a collaboration with my grandfather because I um, juxtaposed images of my family um, that I had taken alongside portraits and my um, snapshots, if you will, that my grandfather had taken. So again, we taking the family archive, extending the language and of where the family archive can actually happen. And that's why I think was sort of present about this body of work, the fact that if you think about those works will often maybe remain in certain archives. So what does it mean to bring those works into the context of like a contemporary space? And I, I think it cannot be overstated because that's something which is more um, prevalent now in contemporary discourse, but at that time, the, the once somehow think about the construction of an identity exemplified by these works, but also bringing in the, the um, not the purity, but bringing in the family archive as a way to talk about the intertextual intertextuality between the two. Right. So um, that said, um, The Good Life um, opened in September um, 1994 at Jack Tilton Gallery, and the, um, the whole gallery was painted red, black, and green. Um, um, up until that point, um, I had assumed, as a lot of people did, that the red, black, and green flag um, was emerged in the 1970s, 1960s, that is. But as we know, it emerged in the 19, uh, 1919 or was it 17 when um, the great Marcus Garvey uh, accepted the UNA, the red, black, and green flag as the official flag for the black race. Um, and I was interested in drawing on um, a lot of the black feminist discourse of the 70s, whether that's Fortune Lord, or there's a British call my back, um, um, any number of black um, fem- feminist scholars who were challenging a more masculine, sexist notion of the family of identity, et cetera, and to give this flag elasticity. So that was the background. So once you have the red, black, and green that, that permeated throughout the gallery in terms of literally painted on the wall, but then the backdrop itself was painted, was, excuse me, was red, black, and green velvet that has been sutured. So on that, um, on that backdrop, you had a host of various um, 
visitations, if you will, collaborations, whether that was with um, my dear friend Renee Cox, um, Brett Scott, um, IK, you know, the great IK Uday, et cetera, who were involved in this reimagining what this new family could be. And it's not just in the literal sense, but also in terms of historical figures as well. If we think about someone like Michael Stewart, um, as you mentioned, who was killed by New York's finest. Um, in fact, the super important show that was at the Guggenheim most recently, which is called I, um, On Basquiat, um, Defacement. Okay. And just thinking about it, I remember, um, I think it was a short bio on Michael Stewart in the New York Times um, um, at his death, but this photograph was published many times in the New York Times after the show, and Harlan Collar wrote about the importance for Michael Stewart. So I'm interested in the incendiary power of the image for us to return, if you will, to the site of trauma, if you will, and to reimagine other narratives. Similarly, in the collaboration with Renee Cox, I mean, as we all know, the tragic life of Sarah Bartman, who was um, um, brought um, from the Southern Africa, who was put on display and died of um, depression, melancholia, and what does it mean to somehow take the, what was clearly a tragic, traumatic event and to reimagine the idea of the body and um, um, almost in a way that, and I see them, I see these two, but I also see other, other images in this work as a way to um, reimagine the possibility to extend their the, the, the reach in terms of their the efficacy, but also their, you know, their, their transgressiveness and what does it mean to mm. somehow use these tropes of um, one, the, the projection of, let's say, in terms of, 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 of to, to use her body as a way to somehow to suggest otherness, to actually take that projection and to throw it back on the viewer. Similar and to the same Michael Stewart, that this was the, um, so there's multiple things happening. Clearly there's an element of transvestism that's happening, you know, cross play. Well, this is a self portrait of me. Most people who came into the gallery, whether that was a UPS guy or FedEx, did not read, let's say. I mean, it's a, it's a radically different time. So there is an element in terms of being behind the veil. At the same right. time, for those who did read it, I'm interested in that multivalent uh, of the image itself. So I'm also interested in, I, in this idea too, of like portraiture kind of helps us get at like the elusive body, right? Like the, the elusive figure or um, the body in motion, which we, can, we can't sit still. Or um, in the case of Michael Stewart and Sarah, you know, uh, helps us get at um, figures who are no longer with us. And, Absolutely. And yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I like it. And I think it's also important to like go back because it, again, it cannot be overstated um, how these works not only landed in terms of the New York art world, but in terms of there have been scores of dissertations written about these very images and works, you know, among other works by myself and other artists, in terms of how pivotal it was to um, create, to make an intervention. And this is also on the heels of Black Popular Culture Conference, for example. So we're talking about the 1991 seminal conference I mean, I was thinking about looking at looking online and Instagram of the party that was happening for the opening of Black Portraiture coincided with the gala and thinking it was I clearly I had missed and I missed the energy but also thinking about to transport us back to 91 where you had uh, a unprecedented amount of let's say African that Black diaspora people from the multiple continents whether that's Stuart yeah. Hall in London, Carbon and Marissa, Horton Spiller, um, um, Marlon, uh, Marlon, Marlon Riggs, in terms of coming together and to reimagine what is it actually of the Black and Black Bible culture. And for the first time where you had a collaboration with, with the history of the Black tradition with the, the avant-garde up until that point was quite white. Um, in terms of what it, not only in terms of what it was promoting, but in terms of what it was archiving, et cetera. So that a lot of these images and works come out of the almost the, the systemic shift that was happening culture at that particular time. And particularly if you think about the, um, the backlash against critical race theory, um, thinking about that was the seed at which those conversations were coming into formation. So I think it's very important not and I think it's important to overstate the importance of the legacy 
because often in black culture production, as um, the great um, um, John Comfort has said, the black avant garde is always having to reproduce itself because we, we, we ourselves are not acknowledging and archiving. And Sarah Lewis has also said that it's one thing to have a party, exhibitions, et cetera, but in terms of the archive, in terms of the journals, in terms of the books, those are areas in which we do have to catch up in terms of documentation, if that makes any sense. Uh, makes perfect sense. Um, that's a perfect sort of segue into a next question, which um, uh, brings us, or brings me to ask you, you know, what does it mean now? Uh, your work in the present context. I mean, the work we're showing, the families from 94, you just um, described sort of the context of that moment. And what does that mean now? What is the same? What is, um, what is similar? Um, well, I, I, again, I, I think it's an extraordinary time that we're living in. And I think on several different fronts, um, um, in terms of unprecedented, which I tend to use the word often, but unprecedented ascendancy of black cultural producers, um, black um, curators, um, um, black um, CEOs. And it's, it, it wasn't as if these people were not there before, but the fact that there has been a radical cracking of institutions. And the, but I think, the, I think it remains what has come um, as, um, um, as uh, Nikki Hannah-Jones said recently in Democracy Now!, as you know, Nikki Hannah-Jones of the, the, um, the deeply important 1619 project, after this two years of um, COVID, um, the biggest social um, justice move in our lifetime, in terms of taking an assessment. So I think it remains open. And so I think, whereas I think it's important to celebrate, it's also remains important to look at um, what are some of the backlashes and how is this next generation, meaning your generation, realizing, well, how do we actually carry on the mantle of the work that's been done? Because this is sort of like, these are games that could be, that are important to celebrate, but how do we further um, cement them? How do we use those games that have been made to reach out to other spaces in which um, those areas that need to be further, 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 further developed? And I'm even thinking about, um, I mean, how do we also memorialize those who were on the front line? Now, I was there in terms of talking to people, thinking of my friend Jocelyn McFadden, who called me um, right after the, the murder, um, you know, the, um, uh, the execution of George Floyd. And he got in the car, and within 11 hours, he was at the protest. And I'm thinking, how do we as a community, as artists, memorialize and document, because I think in a way, where are those um, monuments to the people, you know, whose bodies were actually on the line? And to echo what um, Angela Davis and Cornel West has said, it was an unprecedented amount of multiple identities, black, Latino, white, straight, trans, queer, et cetera, who are occupying streets. So I still think it remains for us to find the skin. And that's something that I'm interested in developing right now. What is a skin that actually addresses the pluralities of that? So whereas, you know, a Black American portraiture is deeply important, along with Obama portraits, what remains, what is the unfinished business that has to be done in terms of somehow giving language and creating spaces in those institutions for works that are maybe not as finished or identities which are not as polished or maybe not tied to the market. How do we create space for that in those institutions, if that makes any sense? It makes, um, um, well, it's incredibly um, inspiring for an emerging curator like myself to hear. Um, it makes me wonder, I mean, and this is something I, I, I grapple with in my work too, sort of, you know, um, Black people have, been, have always been hyper visible in the Americas. <laughs> Um, yes. and, and, and like to argue, actually, there's been no lack of representation of us. We're absolutely we're hyper, absolutely. hyper yeah. uh, visible in the American imagination. So it makes me wonder about um, the, uh, both the uh, what you're saying, sort of the document or the portrait um, and its power to memorialize. Um, as you've done here with Michael Stewart, but also what are what are its lim what are the limitations of representation as well? That was interesting because even thinking about the Hindi in the recent Black popular, um, excuse me, the documentary Black Art, um, 
um, inspired by uh, the great late David Driscoll. And in that, he mentioned seeing, um, experiencing Thelma Golden's landmark exhibition that you mentioned, you know, Black Male, and what it meant for him to see, or Thomas Lapps, for the matter, to see the images of my images of constructs and how the poems of what might be what Oakland Razor, or the great o late Oakland Razor, might have called outlandish to him, inspired someone like the Hindi to see what was possible in terms of occupying another space, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. So an image what might have been outlandish at the opening and might have rustled certain feathers, whether that was in at the Whitney or um, you know, at the Hammer, that there were someone who was young or scores of people who were young and said, oh, something else is possible. So I think those narratives and those stories, and I sort of commend to Hindi for acknowledging the fact that, oh, how do we, how do I acknowledge, like I mentioned, um, here's a Carby. How do I acknowledge those people who have come before, as you're saying, because there's, there there's not a dearth of those histories. In fact, we have volumes of history. And the fact that this is not the first time we're having black curators, and to look at those, you know, those who have actually gone on, who, who were not recognized, you know, how do we give voice to, to the unsung? I mean, how do we give voice, you know, and I mean, to the little middle passage, but also in the metaphorical sense, you know, for those, you know, who, who for all, for all the um, Thelma Goldens, for one who made it and excelled and expanded and, and Christine, uh, Christine and Kim, who shifted the landscape, what about those who could not make it, did not have the voice or the tenacity, et cetera, if that makes any sense. So I'm interested in maybe Saidiya Hartman in her latest book, that's what she's talking about in terms of how do we, how do we almost um, create a skin or language or a voice or, or text for that. And, uh, and I, I, I'm not saying I, I, I have the answer, but it's something that, that, that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, so. Right. I wonder if... Um, Can I say one other thing? Or, yeah, of course. I think it's <laughs> also important to talk about um, the limits also, inherent limits of portraiture, for example, um, to engage some of these concerns. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Even thinking about um, what it meant for me to have shot the Ectochrom archive, but what did it mean to actually make work, to make that archive active for today so it doesn't become one that is romantic and a repository of the past, but how do you make that documentation how do you, what do you bring it to life today? How do you engage a public um, today? So I think that was important. I'm also thinking about the watering hole that was actually done, created out on the West Coast, that at a certain point, I had to reach a limit with portraiture to deal with certain types of representations, if that makes any sense. The fact that I almost have to have a conceptual shift um, to, to shift the terrain of representation. I'm thinking about through the work of less assemblage, all the work of, let's say, collage, in a way to cause a certain rupture of how black bodies were being perceived and consumed. You know, I mean, I'm not going to talk about Malpathor here, but then I have a, I've met Malpathor, but I had a complicated relationship, but I think that's just emblematic of a certain type of representation of black male identity. What does it mean to somehow to talk about notions of consumption in the larger sense? And I think, what are, what are some of the conceptual strategies that, I've employed to actually expand that whole discourse, if that makes any sense. It does. I mean, in collage itself, as, as, um, as a methodology, is rupturing. Um, and it enables sort of something, um, you know, a, a compiling of, of disparate yet connected ideas into a singular uh, moment or composition. Um, and so, you know, coming from, you know, uh, you know, uh, far distant histories in which, you know, African, uh, African slaves didn't have, you know, they, they didn't write the text, right? But like we passed down sort of uh, culture through oral traditions and music and, you know, other cultural expressions, um, you know, the elusiveness of, of, of language and text and sort of bringing mm -hmm. them together mm -hmm. through um, imaginative practices of mm -hmm. like collage. Yeah, I think this is one, I think this is an interesting image to talk about. Um, 
because it was, there were five of us, um, Chuck Close, um, Marilyn Martin, Nan Golden, um, Robert Frank, and Dwayne Michaels, who were commissioned to do um, self-portraits in anticipation of the 2000 election year. And um, at that time, there was discussion whether or not a black person could portray Christ. And I think it's important to some acknowledge that because in this somehow huge celebratory moment, there could be an amnesia of what was at stake even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And there was a debate. And I was also um, struck by the, the hyper-violence against the, um, at that time, Louima, who was sodomized by New York's finest. So this is a influence of the image that explored, uh, ex explored that, the idea of the passion, but also the, vi the violence on black men or black people and black men in specific in this situation. Um, so um, I remember when I, um, I was commissioned to do this portrait and um, which you might not see here, there's my, it says 1965 on my, I think my right, my right, um, my right shoulder. But I met, this appeared in the New York, full page in the New York Times Magazine. And I remember when I brought this to my friend and editor, Kathy Ryan, it was, she was a little warped. I mean, it had to go to, to the edits of the whole magazine. And I think there is a potential for portraiture to actually incite and to cause a rupture in the viewer, if that makes any sense. And I'm interested what it means, one thing to do something in the context of a gallery, for example, um, with the good life, but what does it mean to take that conceptually driven idea of the performative and to have it um, engage with the topical as well as the historical and cause a rupture in a place like the New York Times. And I, I'm interested in terms of the idea of um, images and circulation and what does it mean to somehow, because um, right now it's probably people more familiar with right now, but at that time to what does it mean to somehow cause a rupture in the type of it, um, images, let's say the New York Times might've been acceptable to represent the other. And I was curious about that, so. I wonder what then sort of leaping off sort of the possibilities for portraiture to rupture um, and certainly within the, the context of the archive or within, you know, broader circulations of media, what do you envision for the future of portraiture? What are, what are the, um, what are the themes or discussions do you think that'll be prevalent um, uh, moving forward? I mean, I, I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I can't exactly say that I have the answer. Um, I would say that um, I think we're in an unprecedented time and I do feel there is the potential for us to use not only the image, portraiture, but language as a way to deal with unfinished business. So I'm thinking about um, during the celebration, for example, of... Um, the opening of Black American Portraits, um, there was a CBS interview um, with a Ghanaian, a Nigerian journalist residing in Ghana about the recent um, um, bill that's up, um, going up for parliament, a draconian bill against gays and lesbians, um, let's say trans peoples in Ghana. And as you know, Ghana has always been a country that's protected as minorities, whether that's political minorities, ethnic minorities, if you think about, um, and I, 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 in a way, Richard Wright documented that in his seminal book, Black Power, but that has always been, I, my Angela was invited and Kruma had an open space where um, a range of different types of people could come and actually create, you know, create community. Um, du Bois, um, yeah, as you know, um, retired there. Um, so uh, um, in terms of the future, how do we, um, how do we celebrate, but how do we harness that celebration, the energy that we have to go to those areas of the world, whether that's Ghana, but also our backyard, for example, in, re in reference to the, um, to the um, comedian I mentioned, that how do we use the language of portraiture or the unprecedented access we actually have to make our communities more um, 
responsible and to engage with the contemporary, if that makes any sense. I'm thinking about recently, um, I, I heard about the, the baby's comment about HIV and gay people in the concert, and I'm thinking about, um, I mean, he has his right to make those comments. I mean, he has his choice. It's, you know, he's, but I'm just thinking about, but it's a fact on, for example, okay. perceptions around HIV within the black community. So, I mean, so how do we use portraiture or the discourse to somehow ferret out those spa those atavistic spaces that that need to be brought up into the contemporary space? If that makes any sense. So I'm not sure if that if that's a um, in, you know indirect response, but I feel like I think it's important to be able to harness this um, rich, deep time to somehow to to ask those questions. If you think about um, on the day, um, the second day of the, the second day of the George Floyd um, demonstrations, that there was a trans person that was attacked the second day. So, and it blew up on social media. All of a sudden, black lives, black trans lives became a thing. I remember, I mean, it became a major thing. So I think, I think those are for me, are. Uh, talk to that there's almost like an unwillingness to somehow accept business as usual. So I think portraiture um, and social media and occupying space and voices is a way to somehow ferret out those spaces that need to somehow still be dealt with, if that makes any sense, if, that, if that's not too idealistic. Not at all. Um, very well, um, well put. I wonder if we could skip ahead to some of um, your more recent works. Um, there's this beautiful, um, well, this this work, of course. Um, I'm also interested in sort of the the next slide too. Um, these more recent portraits of Ta-Nehisi Coates and Dina Lawson in the next image. Um, just made this year. And so I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about these these new works um, and your thinking now. Um, you have a good question. I mean, um, well, should we start with um, the two portraits? Um, Wherever you'd like. Uh, yeah, okay, well, yeah. let, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well um, the Dina Lawson portrait is a recent portrait that was on the occasion for um, the profile um, in the New York Times Magazine by Jenna. Wortham, which is a great, fantastic um, um, profile on Dina. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful opportunity just thinking about um, what does it mean for um, one photographer, or one artist to document the other. And I'm interested in, just from a historical sense, in terms of constructing the other, constructing and ha having that exchange, and also the element of like pleasure, power play. In fact, I mean, Dina is deeply skilled in terms of like her saying to me, knowing what I was going to shoot with before I actually arrived there. And that, you know, that, that I mean, the encounter, I mean, for me, portraiture is not just about having a subject. The fact that it is about, it is about collaboration. So I'm interested in the synergy that comes between having an encounter with someone who I deeply admire and someone who admires me and then creating that, creating that language together. And also the idea of giving a power in a way, because she is also very skilled at doing self-portraits. And she uh, had a, a very, she had an idea of how she wanted to be represented and what does it mean to trust another to somehow to be able to offer. And she um, um, is deeply, you know, she very much enjoy, enjoy, enjoys the portrait. It's also such as yeah. beautiful, we were talking about legacy, legacy makings and sort of cross, cross generation sort of um, encounters and, and relationships. So um, really beautiful. I don't know if we want to go back to the- Yeah, we can go back to Ta-Nehisi. And I also love this one. It was interesting because when I was reading, um, um, I got the pride to um, his similar book um, coming out. What's the title of the book? Um, his first book, his, his, um, his um, a letter to his um, his son. His son. What's the title of the book? Um, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come up. Okay. Um, anyway, so I got obviously I, I did not I could not read the whole essay because it was right before the book. Was, this was for New York New York Magazine, and so I got um, I got um, a few chapters, and there was one about um, him being at Howard and encountering. Um, this is interesting. Encountering. Um, 
um, a partner, a friend at a time who um, had, um, whose parents were, might have been um, one parent, I think they were, they were the queer um, men and women, but they were um, exploring their own identities. And I thought in a way that, you know, before meeting him, I was saying, well, you know, do I have to, is this going to be a challenging portrait session? And it's sort of the idea of, let's say, you know, as, as an image producer showing up and thinking, who is he going to be? And right. then just seeing this, you know, amazing, you know, deeply gifted, but also super gentle, but also um, coming from the Bronx, <laughs> as I do, and thinking that I have to protect my own turf, it was sort of like that almost like, you know, using the camera as a way to create a language. And at the same time, I was confronted with someone you know, who was, you know, deeply spiritual and soft. But it was interesting for me. It was a diff It was also looking at my own, my own limitations in terms of like what I might perceive without knowing the fact that as opposed to him being an ally, I mean, he's an ally clearly, but he's someone who was deeply, was deeply moved by his, by his writing, but also, um, what am I saying? I'm saying that it was, it was, it was a very, it was a wonderful experience of actually creating this portrait with him and just being able to create this new, um, um, vision of modernity, you know, and 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 and, and language, and um, and someone who had very, you know, in a deeply gifted way, um, spoke in this very poetic way, um, in a very moving way, a letter to a letter to his son, you know, very much inspired by you know Baldwin and what it meant to Caron's legacy, Caron's legacy between the world and me. Yes, between the world and me. Yes. <laughs> um, I love to sort of in, in this idea of encounter and exchange too, the way you're describing um, your collaboration sort of portraiture is also, I mean, we think of it as about portraying the other, but really, as you've demonstrated, it reveals you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't take a lot of commissions. I should just say, appreciate that. But I do see it um, that the image itself, whether they're in this case, uh, on Tanahasi or Dina or the one of Kahindi or any porch is that it's more of an experience. It's more of an exchange if that makes any sense. I mean, that that's to me becomes lasting. I mean, because there are, you know, there are billions of photographs out there and th that interests me less. It's more about how does one have an encounter with some and to offer up a third possibility. And I think it's more in that line in terms of like, I mean, for example, the portraits of Tanahasi went into the National Portrait Collection and that's going to be the representation of him, you know, for, you know, you know, for, for, for generations to come. And to be, it's an honor to have um, created that. But I also want to respect the, the background, the tension that goes into creating that, if that makes any sense, that there is a certain frisson, there's a certain, like, say, tension and a certain um, working through. Um, and I love, there's a certain beauty. And similarly, you know, with um, Dina, in terms of, let's say, like her asking me, um, you know, knowing, you know, she thought I was going to shoot in Polaroid and you know, what it's going to be, what camera, how she wants. And, and also, it was amazing just to see. Because I'm very controlling to see someone equally somehow controlling about sure. the image, etc. And then at a certain <laughs> point, okay, well, we're both going to surrender that. And also trust. I mean, right. you know, the idea of tr tr trust and also be able to create a space for that. You know, we don't see that an image, whether that's, you know, candles or, you know, you know, just creating that, creating that, that sphere of, let's say, intimacy and, um, and you still do it, um, doing a show at the, the Guggenheim, just in terms of, in terms of the use of crystals and like I said, well, crystals and incense, creating that, that space of safety, but also transcendence, maybe, the, you know, for mm -hmm. that one. And through that one is arrived at somehow um, something, something else, which I love. I love this idea of uh, the, the potential of the portrait to be trans, to, to transcend, to be, to be transcendent. Um, Somehow we've managed to, I think, address almost all of the five questions <laughs> inadvertently. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask the last one. Okay. Also sensitive, we're running out of time. Okay. okay. Um, but what do you hope a viewer will take with them after having seen your work? Well, I think it's not, not only my work, but also the exhibition, you know, just in terms of just to... I was looking through um, the checklist and just seeing, going back to the 19th century photographs, I and mean, it's just, I mean, it's something so deeply joyful, you know, that 
these images have all um, been brought together under you know the um, Black American portraiture uh, portraits in relationship to Amy Kahindi's you know presidential portraits um, and um, Obama Michelle's. It's just it's quite it's quite remarkable that we are at this particular moment, you know. And I think it's in, uh, it's a time for celebration and um, and just the. I mean, it, can, it cannot be overstated just the the joy, you know, and the satisfaction that, um, and also being an educator in terms of, um, I think it's important for us to take these, these, these histories and these experiences and to celebrate them, but also to realize there's still work to be done, um, um, not only in states which are, um, not only in states which are outlawing critical race theory, but also, let's say, in, in places which you think were that, that these types of um, um, discourses would be taught, you know? I mean, I was shocked. Um, uh, a, young, um, um, a young artist, um, editor um, at a major magazine, um, BIPOC, you know, um, African-American and, and Latino, he, he had not, and he's, 25 30 and he had he was went to school in rochester he had not heard of me and so there's something and right. i think sarah lewis has spoken about that again and with her example where exemplary you know um curriculum shifting with aperture the absolute necessity for to celebrate but also to go back to those spaces which remain where the widow's work remains to be done sure. is what I'm saying. so but um, does that answer? Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, deep yeah, joy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place to uh, to maybe to start to wrap up, and I think we okay. have time for just one question from okay. our um, from I our was audience. Long winded. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure, pleasure talking with you. Oh, you as well. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I'll just do one from an anonymous attendee. What separates a, por a portrait versus, of a, versus a picture of a person or a picture that refers to a larger set of people? Is there a separation? So I guess that kind of gets back to our early discussion about like the documents versus more staged constructions what's the difference between a a portrait versus a picture of a person um are I they one the same well i i think i think there's some i think there may be some will maybe make some distinctions between the two um but i definitely think there's um they correlate um i think a portrait could potentially be a um a portrait can be a particular representation of, of, of another. Um, um, but I think a portrait could be a, 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 a portrait of the people at a particular time. You know, I'm even thinking about the, um, the 1619, you know, project, the book that just came out in terms of it thinking about of a, a portrait of a, a people at a particular moment in cultural history doing a particular type of work if that makes any sense. And within that, for example, this book of 1619, um, they, there's a, a, uh, a series of um, photographs that open each chapter that are um, several people who are, um, uh, some are known, some are not known, but then it's, it's like the American, it's like the African American vernacular. So in a way that the book itself is a portrait, the project of, of a people at this particular moment but there are portraits within that of particular people, some known, um, some, I mean, some identifiable, such as Hannah Jones's father, but then other people who are not identified, but, but that are symbolic of a particular um, African diasporic, African person at a particular cultural history that leaps across the pages. And I think both are equally, um, equally important. So I give voice to 
the specificity of a portrait of, let's say, Medina Lawson or ta that speaks at this particular time, but also in terms of um, culture, but also to those um, pictures of people who stand in for a portrait of a particular time, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, one question from Helen Mangano. Can you discuss what images do you have in mind, Lyle, as a form of activism to address the current voting issues as this critical junction, juncture in our history? Um, I guess I'm being put on the spot. Um, I, think, I think those images do exist. I mean, I think, I, and maybe that was trying to allude to before um, in terms of... Um, when I was talking about how, how do we memorialize, because clearly um, there has been a shift in terms of the political landscape, and what I say two years ago, and what brought that to bear. If you think about Stacey Abrams' work that she did, I mean, um, work, work has been written about and spoken about, but in terms of like this her, but who were all the constituencies who were part of that? shift. So I don't think it's about creating other images as opposed to going to the archive and going in, into memorializing the everyday, the vernacular for the shift that, that have actually taken place, which I think is important. And, th and by acknowledging that, that gives space to, for other images to come into formation. Right. Right. I just want to echo to what you said at the early in the early on in the conversation to sort of the the power of vernacular images to as forms of as forms of activism like the family portrait is a, as a form of activism or, or resistance. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, one more question. One more. Um, I'm very. This is from Demetrio Brox Broxton. Uh, they ask. I'm very interested in the choices to depict. Michael Stewart as both feminine and in the uniform of his killers. Can you please say more about this? Um, I would, I, would, I might phrase it differently. I think Baldwin's um, read on the black policeman would be an interesting read. So um, um, I don't necessarily how see his killers. I think the the police obviously represent for there was the police stand in for force and power, but I'm interested in the complicatedness and trying to problematize that uniform, if that makes any sense. Um, um, that said, um, I'm thinking about to be for us to, that Michael, St. Michael Stewart is that is the return to the primal scene. It's a return, it's mm -hmm. about not forgetting. Right. It's about remembrance. Right. It's about as opposed to that particular suit, which is a construct being reduced to the suit that killed Michael Stewart. It's the act of remembrance. It's the act of having the suit be a stand into both state violence, but also issues of, and I think Baldwin has spoken, uh, spoken about that. So I, th I, th I think it's complicated. And what does it mean for that, um, the spirit of Michael Stewart or in the case of Sarah Bartman to somehow take this, these, um, these, um, these garments, if you will, and to somehow to make bear to speak to us, even thinking about um, the, um, yeah, so I, I would say that, yeah, if that makes any sense. I think beautifully put and um, remembrance too is a lovely sort of place to, to conclude and, and to bring our thoughts to. Um, I just want to thank you, Lyle, um, so much for your work. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, for your work, um, for your energy, and um, we're just so delighted to put, to feature your work in um, Black and American Portraits. So it's a real pleasure. Much. Look forward to meeting and seeing the show. <laughs> and thank you also to our audience for joining. Yes, us. absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Enjoy. Take care. Bye bye.